And this is how anti-competitive actions affect independent filmmakers. So today we are going to be talking about my capstone paper, which has three different topics. There's a lot more, but for time purposes, we will be talking about two significant lawsuits in the film industry. US versus Paramount, Sony versus Universal, and then my last topic is how Amazon Prime has a very terrible relationship with independent filmmakers. So to get started, we're gonna talk about US versus Paramount. This was in the 1940s when the film industry was dominated by a studio system. This system basically had a few major studios. I think it was around eight of them, including Paramount, Fox, Warner Brothers, those studios had control over every end of the film industry. Exhibition, production, distribution. You couldn't watch a film without going to the theater. There was 2,300 theaters in the United States. You only needed to have 500 theaters to have full control over exhibition. And they used methods like block booking, blind bidding to control these theaters that they did not own. So what ended up happening was the United States government was not happy with this because they are using unfair practices to control theaters that they do not own. What ends up happening is they file a federal lawsuit against all the major studios, but it's the US versus Paramount. What ends up happening is throughout several years of going to trial, it eventually goes up to the Supreme Court. And what ends up happening with the Supreme Court is they basically say, you gotta get rid of these theaters. You cannot own these theaters. You have to divest. So what ends up happening is the studio system is dismantled. Theaters are separate. It's the way it is now, where exhibitors are like AMC and all those big companies, and, the, and those big studios are their own thing. My argument is that with streaming services, we are returning to a new studio system. Yes, they still do not control movie theaters, but now they can just say, we don't need you, we're gonna go out and publish our films on our own website and make as much money as we want. So, I forgot to mention this, but my mentor, Professor Gary Collins at Eastern, has a lot of background knowledge of this, and my arts connection was an interview with him. So, basically it dismantles the studio system. The thing is, the studio system was already under assault, if you will, uh, by the, the, the burgeoning of television that was beginning to be a factor. Um, but essentially, it uh, basically uh, took the one leg of the three-legged stool that basically constituted the basis of the studio system, which was the idea that each individual company produced, distributed, and exhibited. So you had a three-legged stool, if you will. If you remove one of the three legs, obviously, the stool's going to fall over. So now we're going to move on to the... Uh... Sony versus Universal. Let me ask you all a question. Who has heard of Betamax? Please give me a raise of hands. Betamax is a commercial failure. As we know, VHS obviously was supreme in the 80s and the 70s in that era. So what ends up happening that lets us have the physical ownership of film is Sony releases the Betamax. And what this device does is it lets you record television broadcasts from your home. You can watch them anytime you want. You can skip over to commercials. It's the beginning of a new era for entertainment. Universal was not happy with this product, obviously, because they fear that they're gonna be pirated, that someone could just record a film on their TV and then sell it illegally. So what they end up doing is they take Sony to court. Now, around this time, no one had any right to own a film. The way you would watch a film is by renting the experience of a film. There was multiple ways you could do this. You could go to a movie theater, but if you had a little bit more money, you had a projection system and all that, you could go up to the studio and say, hey, I want a film reel. As long as you knew how to do everything, you could rent a 16 millimeter print of that film. And the funny thing is, there was people who would actually go out, take the film, duplicate it, they'd keep the original and give the duplicate back to the studio. So what ends up happening is the studios want control over copyright. They want full ownership of their films. This is your five minute warning. So what ends up happening 
is this lawsuit. And the ruling is that Sony can do whatever they want, VHS can insist, you can own a film. Well, that's, that, as I say, the Sony versus Universal opens up the floodgates for uh, pri you know, personal private acquisition of, of a film. Uh, because prior to that case going all the way up to the Supreme Court, the thing is, no, nobody in the general public legally owned a film. The, the film was owned only by the copyright holders. The thing is, once um, uh, that decision came down, uh, then the studios themselves moved into marketing VHS tapes and eventually marketing DVDs as well. And now we're going to go into our final topic, which is Amazon Prime and independent filmmakers. This is a very interesting relationship as independent filmmakers has always had it tough. They've always been on their own. If you look into the living conditions of filmmakers in the 80s and 90s, they lived a very hard life. Some people would even like go through garbage just to get food, but it's that they go to extreme lows, living off of people's couches and all that. And in order to afford a film, the method was maxing out credit cards taking out ridiculous amounts of debt with the slight hope that you would get enough money from the film's profits to pay off all that debt and make the credit card companies happy. But what ends up happening in, I think, 2016 is Amazon Prime comes out with this service. Basically, if you know how to upload a YouTube video, you can basically publish the film to Amazon Prime. Sounds good and all that. Now they're going all to, to all the big film festivals saying, hey, publish your films to us. You'll make money, we'll make money, everyone's happy. What ends up happening is people put slideshows like this on the Amazon Prime. They put gameplay footage on the Amazon Prime. What does Amazon do? They don't make money. They begin restricting what you can put on Amazon Prime because they don't care about you. They care about the money. So what ends up happening is everyone's angry at Amazon. All the independent filmmakers out there are going to other resources, other companies to distribute their films. What you can do is you can either pay a ridiculous amount of money to have someone go up to a streaming service and then say, hey, this is a film, put it out there. Or you can go to other websites which will be like, hey, we'll, we'll market your film for you, we'll get your film out there, but we'll take a cut of your profit. So like, there's resources out there you can even create your own streaming service at this point if you're willing to pay the money, but you have to then spend your time on marketing because no one's gonna watch it if they don't know where it is. You can also just put it on YouTube, but YouTube doesn't really pay you that much. Amazon doesn't pay you that much if you're still gonna go that route. If you, use, if you choose to have your money come from Prime subscriptions only, meaning only Prime people can view it, what ends up happening, you get penny per view hour. If you choose to make it rent or buy, you only make 50% of your profit. So basically, Amazon Prime isn't the way to go. First of all, um, what you want to do is, is you want to know going in, who are you making this film for? Okay, that's the first thing you want to know. Because the thing is, if you're just making it for yourself, that's fine. I mean, you're not a problem. But don't expect to necessarily be very successful with it, certainly not financially, okay? Because you are talking about, again, if you're talking about classical Hollywood cinema, you're talking about narrative feature fiction. How much do I think it's going to cost, okay, because you want to know going in, uh, unless you're planning on doing it over a period of years, which, I mean, some people do. All right, so we're going to talk about the legacy of this project and wrap everything up. The legacy of this project is... This project is something that could be continued beyond what I'm saying right now. Because the film industry is something you cannot conclude. What I'm concluding with today is that Hollywood isn't the way to go. You can go to Connecticut. We have an infancy film industry. We have a film industry that's in the stepping stones. There's film companies here that have been successful without depending on Hollywood. So why go to Hollywood when you can make a name for yourself in a state like Connecticut where it's going to be cheaper to make a film and have a better shot at being successful? And now the thing is, the legacy is to continue on with this project. Does anyone have any questions?
one real quick. Could you remind me what was your essential question? It is, how does anti-competitive actions affect independent filmmakers? Do you need me to tell you my community connection? Yes, sir. My community connection was an X-Block that I held back in March. Things, there were some technical issues, but we were able to have an open discussion about the film industry with many of these topics. And we showed my arts connection when you saw this up today. Does anyone have any other questions? You said you had other topics in your essay. What were some uh, what were the other topics? The other topics were Disney. Disney had a lot of, Disney is known for being trigger happy with their lawyers. They sued Redbox. They even lobbied Congress to have Mickey Mouse be within their control for a little bit longer. That copyright expires next year. Expect them to return to Congress to keep control over Mickey Mouse. Does um, anyone else? Beyond your mentor, what was a big source that you were able to use for a lot of your research? Well, well, I actually have the sources on here. So I use a lot of government websites. Like I had to find actual like bills in Congress. I had to find like the actual like opinions of Supreme Court lawsuits. But this was a lot of research. One of the lawsuits I looked into, I had to actually find the actual court documents from that lawsuit from the court in California. So there is a lot of information about this stuff that is still out there. 